Now comes the entertaining part of the lecture. Do you remember when we studied medicine? You heard that prostate and breast are very similar organs. I'd like to show you that this is true, and I'm going to tell you why is it important for you. Both of them are fluid-producing organs. Here is the breast. That's the milk factory. Lobule, terminal ductal lobule unit. And here are the cells within the acini. Same story in the prostate. And if the fluid is produced, there has to be a duct and there has to be a hole. Both of them have it. This is the breast, three-dimensional histology. Within that, those lovely cells that produce this miracle called milk. Milk is produced out of blood. Can you imagine that? Have you ever thought about it? And it goes into the subsegmental duct and the baby is happy. Three-dimensional histology, acini, just like the rubber gloves having 40 fingers. This little guy, all together, one millimeter, produces so much milk. Yeah, but there are thousands of them. This is the three-dimensional histology, and this is the low, and this is a higher or intermediate magnification of the acinus with the, the basement membrane and the myopithelial cell layer and the epithelial cells. But, you know, sometimes things can go wrong. As you can see, here are these tiny acini, but look how inflatable they are. Why? Because the cells changed. That change we call metaplasia. And it, the cells stain pink, pink cells, apocrine metaplastic cells. They produce fluid, and of course, the acini are going to distend small cysts, large cysts, or your patients squeeze out this cloudy, brown, ugly-looking fluid. That's the story of fibrocystic change. You see the ducts are going to be distended. And of course, if we inject contrast medium, we can image all these. Can you imagine the same thing happens in the prostate? Tell me, which one is the prostate and which one is the breast? Not a chance. Let me help you. Disorder of fluid production. Here's a specimen x-ray of the prostate. This multiloculated cyst is here. And this little one is here. Which one is the breast? Which one is the prostate? This is a breast and this is a prostate. And if the, nor uh, the prostate is normal, then he doesn't have a voiding problem. But if he has this one, not fun. Cysts and benign prostate hyperplasia problem. Do you know what this is? Cross-section of a pomegranate. And do you know what this is? Cross-section of a prostate. It's called prostate calculi. But before it becomes calcified, it's a very concentrated proteinaceous material. It's called amyloid bodies. And the protein sends out a signal to the calcium, let me marry you. And then you get a prostate calculi. And the resulting calcification is beautiful, crystal, onion ring-like, oyster pearl-like. But that was the prostate. And this is the breast. Same type of calcium we have. And this is the troublesome multiple cluster powdery calcification. And you're scratching your head what you're looking at. And you will never find that because there is a 50% chance that you are looking at sclerosing adenosis, and there is a 50% chance that you are looking at grade 1 inside the carcinoma, but that belongs to the teaching point. You see the breast, you see the prostate. I'm just building up to the point that the normal prostate and the benign changes in the prostate and the breast are very similar. But the same is valid in cancer. This is a specimen x-ray of breast, and this is a specimen x-ray of a prostate, within which the cancer was born within the major duct, not in the acini, not in the gland. I don't think that any pathologist could make a difference if I took this away. And why is it important? And now I come to the point. I got so enthused. Because when this anti-screening campaign came, so I started to do prostate cancer research with this very exquisite 
3D pathology. And then I was so positively surprised that the pathologists don't describe the prostate cancer in that complicated way as they describe breast cancer. Tubular, bubular, lobular, whatever. They say the site of origin comes from the fingers, comes from the major duct. Come down to earth to 3D pathology and tell me where does it originate from? Why is it important? Because when the pathologist says AAP, prostate cancer, then that's a curable carcinoma. Nice old man is sitting on his prostate cancer for a long time and get a stroke and die. But when the middle-aged man comes with a backache and you find metastasis everywhere and the primary cancer is prostate, originated from the duct. You utter the word, we communicate with each other, AAP, DAP, and it also describes the long-term outcome. So the two extremes, the majority, indeed, fortunately, 90% of the prostate cancers originate from the gland. What's the percentage in, in breast? 75. Do you know what Luciano Pavarotti died from? Pancreatic cancer. What percentage of pancreatic cancers originate from the gland? What percentage originate from the duct? Bad news. 5% originate from the gland and 95% from the duct. Pancreatic cancer patient doesn't have a chance. Parotid cancer. Don't get a ductal parotid cancer. Asinar parotid cancer, curable, palpable little lump, just like in the breast. And we are going to talk about the killing, uncontrollable breast cancer and prostate cancer. Originates from the top. Screening doesn't help. Fortunately, breast cancer and prostate cancer are very good cancers because 75 or 90 percent originate from the glandular tissue. So when you see a stellate lesion on the mammogram, why does your pathologist call it invasive ductal carcinoma? It has nothing to do with the ducts. So the other extreme is that they call it DCIS in the breast, and they always call it invasive carcinoma in the prostate. As in adenocarcinoma of the prostate, and DAP in the prostate. AAP and DAP. This is known in the literature. We just added, contributed to our knowledge. Prostate DAPs are large, advanced, early recurrence, bad news. What do you think this is? Well, because this is muscle, it cannot be the breast. It's actually the urinary bladder. And this is a very aggressive, aggressive invasive prostate cancer. Looks like DCIS, isn't it? This is a prostate tissue. Here is the specimen x-ray. Here's the 3D pathology, solid cell proliferation fluid and the calcium. It infiltrates the muscle fibers of the urinary bladder. Here we go. This is an invasive carcinoma. Infiltrates the muscle, infiltrates fat. It goes into the lymph vessels and he was dead in six months. So please keep in mind acinoradenocarcinoma or ductal carcinoma. It's so important to distinguish, and they elegantly do in prostate, and totally forget in the breast, <coughs> whether it originates from the gland or from the... But they say it in prostate. So why don't we call it acinoradenocarcinoma of the breast and ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast? It would be so simple. We would understand each other. Dear colleagues, this is a three-dimensional, most beautiful picture of the structures in the breast, and there are four of them. Anybody without medical education knows that if it's a tube, Y shape must be the milk duct. And this one is the varying sized milk factory. This is what we call the gland, and there is a supporting tissue, fibrosis, we hate and fat we love.
We radiologists who read mammograms are funny people because we love two words every woman hates. Age and fat. <laughs> now, dear colleagues, next week or tomorrow, you find these cluster, cross stone like calcifications, and you do core biopsy. And the pathologist is called it DCIS. Excuse me, this is a larvae. These are extremely distended acini. This one is a three dimensional 8 by 10 centimeter section. This is a TDL, this one is a TDL, this one, 50 of them. No, sir, this is not DCS. It's cancer inside to within the TDL unit. Read my lips. That's a good cancer. We can control it. Okay? This is an AAB, Asinar adenocarcinoma of the breast. It can be 22 millimeter. It's cancer in situ within the TDL. So if we were running a calcification analysis course, you would immediately magnify and would take the magnifying glass and you would look at the shape and the density. Nothing wrong with that, but it's a wrong order. You have to decide whether it's coming out from the TDL or from the duct. And it's very simple. Because if it's cluster calcification, then there are only two discernible and not discernible. Well, difficult. This is a grade one and this is a grade two. But it's not DCIS. Inside to carcinoma within the duct is long and Y shaped. And this is the most frequent, 50%. And this one is. 75%, 25%, so 75% of the insights actually originate from the TDLU, but your pathologists always call them DCIS. Not exactly. This is the story. You find a group of calcifications and you start to doodle like this. Hey, this is not in the duct. No. And after that, I'm asking a question, are they discernible? Yes. In that case, there is only one Inside to carcinoma, grade 2 within the TDLU. And how many benign options? Fibrocystic change, fibroadenoma, and papilloma in that order. This is more frequent. You have to use larger bore needle biopsy in order to distinguish. And then they accuse you that you are <coughs> actually doing harm. Now, anyway, and this one? Calcification, it's long. This is a DAB. Did I say that all of them are going to die? No. But 30% do. Whatever you do, chemotherapy doesn't bite into it, and radiation therapy doesn't do. So here's the next case. And I'm immediately putting beside the... 3D pathology, because if it's a cluster, it must be within the TDL, and it's not discernible. So, actually, there are two options. 50% chance that it's actually just the sclerosing adenosis. Do you know what the sclerosing adenosis is? Hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the TDLU. You grab the fingers of the rubber gloves and pull them out, as well as the strangling proliferation of the intralobular connective tissue, so no, there is no cystic dilatation, and in every tiny little finger there is a crystal. Some of my body like calcium. On the other hand, your fourth case is this. Looks like a snake. It must be in the dark. You know, she was 28 when we had this mammogram. She never turned 31. DAB. And then, if they calcify, then there are two options. Necrosis, yes. When the cancer within the duct is producing fluid, because it's micropapillary, or cribriform, and it calcifies, then we got the amyloid bodies. The amyloid bodies that are very similar to the amyloid bodies within the prostate. And, just like the prostate calcification, they look benign. Look, these are malignant type calcification. We call it skipping stone like calcification. I just wrote a book about it. You know, when we were kids and we picked up the flat stone and we throw on the water. And this is the women beautiful pearl necklace. This is as well 
or result of fluid. But let's go on and talk about long-term outcome. Dear colleagues, this is what's happening, a tiny little TDLU that gets excited in the middle of, middle of the uh, a month or between two menstruation and it gets cooled down. Proliferation and involution. Proliferation and involution goes for decades. And then one day cancer is increasing the pressure. The fingers become shorter, thicker, no finger. If we are lucky, we see the calcification. This shows the many asini. Now, for whatever reason, the asini are very distended. The red is the cancer cells, the yellow is the necrosis. Within it, there are the calcifications, and here is true pathology. Now, you and I put an x-ray tube above it. This is what we are going to get. Multiple clusters. This is the animation. Dear colleagues, this is called DCIS everywhere in the world, and all pathologists are wrong. Any intelligent pathologist would admit it. So you see the big chunks of calcifications and the powdery calcifications. For example, here's a case. A group of de novo calcifications are discovered, screening case, bring her back, magnify it. What is the location? It's a TDLU, right? And now you look at the shape. Yeah, these are malignant type calcifications. Broken needle tip like spearhead, arrowhead, ultrasound, one shot is enough. Here we go. DCIS, right? And you are happy. I'm not. Dear colleagues, this is not a duck, this is an acinus. And they never show you the whole acinus. Could you just decrease the magnification factor here? It's a single terminal ductal lobular unit. So it's grade 2 cancer in situ within the TDL. I have problem with kind of convincing the pathologist, so I pull a joke. So my friend came to my course, Steve Harms, and told Maslow, I have a present for you. Dr. Seuss, too many days. And I was so happy when I saw this. Did I ever tell you that Mrs. McCabe had 23 sons and she named them all day? Now, it certainly wasn't a smart thing to do because she wants to talk with this little guy coming to the house. She doesn't get one. She gets 23 on the run. Now, that caused a lot of problem. Imagine so many days. Why didn't I call them A and B and C and D. Nah. What did I do? I always have a digital camera. And I thought, that's exactly the book I need. Because I cannot convince the pathologists in a normal way, so let me show them a mirror. Have I ever told you that Dr. Breast pathologist had 12 sons? And he, she called them all. DCIS. So one of them doesn't have calcium. You use the ultrasound and you find an intracystic papillary growth. The pathologist calls that was DCIS. Another time it's a bloody nipple discharge, serious nipple discharge, and you do galactography and you know that these are micropapillary cancers. DCIS. Is this different from this? Yes. Just like two kids. And then Architectural distortion, tumor forming, the CIS, and then calcifications, and architectural distortion, and different type of calcium, and different type of calcium, and all of them got one name, the CIS. Those that had the cancer within the ducts, and those that had the cancer within the TDL. So why isn't it okay? Because the time for tumor board is coming, and we say, the CIS come to the tumor board. We don't get one, but we got 12 on the run. So here is the suggestion. Only pathologists can say this is grade one. And they can say the location. If it's a lobule, don't call it a duct. Grade one within the TDLU. Grade two within the TDLU. Or intracystic. Or grade three within the duct. And I can never accept that it's too late. Team up with good open-minded pathologist. The suggestion is drop the D. Because a very similar picture in the prostate is always invasive. Have you ever seen inside the carcinoma as metastasis? How does it get there? Can anybody explain to me how does a major duct go into 
the lymph nodes, or don't ask whether there is myoepithelia cellae or not. That was not my question. I'm talking about the tube. How did the tube get there? Do women have major ducts in their lymph nodes? As soon as I show this and I say, this is in the lymph node, it's invasive. In the prostate, it's invasive. In the breast, it's in situ. No, it's also in the breast. It's invasive. Duct forming invasive carcinoma. So, dear colleagues, after this lecture, whenever you utter the word DCIS, please feel bad. <laughs> because either you don't know what you're talking about, or you don't want to communicate, and that's wrong. And when you see a stellate lesion, it has nothing to do with the ducts. Has it ever happened with you that you missed these kind of calcifications, and then suddenly the calcification started to disappear, and there was a tiny stellate lesion? It came from the TDL. But the official name is invasive ductal carcinoma. Circular lesion, stellate lesion, crushed stone-like powdery calcium, all come from the lobule. And this is where screening works. This is not just play with the words. I never come up with anything less than 25 year survival curves. Once upon a time, here was the little TDL. And within it, in situ carcinoma developed. Look at the long term follow up result. Now we let it grow to 1 to 9 millimeter stellate lesion. Look at this long term survival curve. And we let it grow to 10 to 14 millimeter, and that's where I stop calling them baby. These are baby cancers. Would you mind looking at these slides? Dear colleagues, this is a fantastic thing in this generation. We are able to find the cancer originating from the TDLU early. Actually, you can miss it once or twice. You still save life. Has any other previous generation of physicians ever could show these 25-year survival curves, these percentages? No. And this is a consecutive material. We are not just playing with selected cases, but watch out. When the cancer originates from the TDLU, and when the cancer originates from the duct, not even your oncologist, radiation oncologist, can bring up this curve to higher rate. 1978, 77, 78. Since that time, this curve didn't change a bit. This one used to be big cancer, and we lift it up, courtesy early detection. The diffusely invasive carcinoma has the same poor outcome. And we don't know who belonged to the 30% dead and the 70% survival. I didn't say that all of them die. No, majority don't. But it's not influenced by treatment. So the largest group, the stellate tumors without calcifications, that's the best group. If anybody wants to get a breast cancer, please get that. And the unifocal. Because then, this is the long-term survival. Without extensive surgery and adjuvant treatment, why do we irradiate every breast cancer? No need. Ten years ago, we begged people, please change the TNM classification system. That's so outdated. That was written well before we started screening and reconsider the current therapeutic treatments. We got some confirmation from the United States, and I'm looking forward to getting some confirmation from you. You have two million examinations, are you?